morning. My name is Lois Phillips, pronouns she, hers, and I have the honor of introducing our guest minister today, the Reverend Allison Farnham, pronouns she, her. She is the director and minister of the Unitarian Universalist Prison Ministry of Illinois and an affiliated community minister with Second Unitarian of Chicago. She lives with her partner and two children in Evanston. Please make sure to make her feel welcome after service. Thank you. Hi, my name is Alex Myron. I'm part of our senior high youth group here. My pronouns are he, him. Our call to worship today is Remember by Joy Harjo. Remember the sky that you were born under. Know each of the stars' stories. Remember the moon. Know who she is. Remember the sun's birth at dawn. That is the strongest point of time. Remember sundown and the giving way tonight. Rem remember your birth how your mother struggled to give you form and breath. You are evidence of her life and her mother's and hers. Remember your father, he is your life also. Remember the earth whose skin you are, red earth, black earth, yellow earth, white earth. Listen to them, they are alive poems. Remember the wind, remember her voice, she knows the origins of, the, of this universe. Remember, you are all people, and all people are you. Remember, you are this universe, and this universe is you. Remember. Hi, I'm Leilani Smith. I'm also part of the Senior High Youth Group, and my pronouns are she, her. We light this chalice in remembrance of all who have gone before us, whether they be ancestors of blood relations, adoption ancestors whose ways we inherit, chosen family ancestry, or beloved dead. Especially, may we remember those who have died this year while incarcerated in Illinois detention centers, prisons, and jails. We light this chalice in honor of all lineage learning from their mistakes and growing the fire of compassion and justice in all our relations and in honor and celebration of the month of the gift of heritage and All Souls Day, please rise in body and spirit and join in singing hymn number 96 and then remain risen for the words of our co covenant, I cannot think of them as dead.
Now please stay standing and join us in the reciting of our covenant. We unite to strengthen the bonds of kinship among all persons, to promote human dignity, and to increase reverence for life's creating, sustaining, and transforming power through worship, study, and service. Good morning, it is good to be with you. This morning in our Time for All Ages, we're going to take some time for remembrance. We're coming upon the time where those who come from more earth-centered traditions in this part of the geography of the area, um, folks would recognize in the, in the Wiccan and pagan cultures that the veil between the living and dead is thinning that we are entering perhaps into a liminal time of remembering those who have gone before us as we honor our beloved dead. The reason this is for all ages is because we, as Unitarian Universalists, lift up the kinship of all. And so as we take this sacred time together, there will be music playing, and we invite you to come forward and speak into the microphone, perhaps a person you are honoring who has gone before, and you may light a candle on the altar. We recognize that this is a time of tenderness and care, and that not everyone would want to share, but please know that you are held in this sacred community. And for those joining online, perhaps there is a way that you can name and know that you are being held here, even if you're watching it later, that you're held in this community as you remember, whether your grief is new and tender or old and worn and part of the cycles of your life now, please know it is honored here in this space. Let us begin to honor our beloved dead. James Randall. James Colifer. Susie. Elizabeth. Spishak. Vasca and Ilya. Donna. Catherine. Eleanor. Reed Smith. Lauren O'Connor McDonald. Neil Chang. Lynn Russell White and my mom and dad. Bill Frank, my dad. Carl Thornton.
Ruth Bittner, and Joseph Pierce. John Howard, teacher and friend. Miko. Anne Stroll and Mary Verbos. My nephew, Joseph Adam Henry Baeson. My grandmother, Patusu, and some pets, Ronnie, Kirby, Serendipity, and Carly. Sonia and Sam Phillips. My sister, Janine Marie Dexter. My dad, Edinburgh. My dad, Richard Gilly. My mom, Rogene Jackson. My parents, Bill and June Scallon, and Crazy Charlie Hall. And for Passion Young, who died at Pontiac Prison last week. Beloveds, I invite you to gaze upon this altar. Each light is a reminder of what we carry forward. Each light a reminder of lives that still live in us. Gaze upon the glow where love and grief intertwine. Will you please join me in the spirit of prayer and meditation understanding that we all have different bodies that move differently when we want to pray or meditate. So for some of us, it may be that your body becomes still. 
others of us need to color and wiggle. All of these expressions are welcome. You may notice that you want your eyes to close. And if that doesn't feel good for you, perhaps you can allow your gaze to soften as you take in the glowing lights of love on this altar. And let's take a deep breath in. And slowly exhale. And another deep breath in. And slowly exhale. As we come here mindful of the cycles of life, that even our bodies with every inhale and exhale remind us. That as we look at the leaves outside, we are reminded of a world of change, of transitions, of holy passages that deserve our notice. And that as we gather together, as all ages, embracing all of who we are, all our voices, that we might know that this is a holy place of remembrance. And perhaps as we breathe together to take a moment to see if some intention comes up for you some commitment that you might want to make or live into in the next week or month, perhaps as you consider a sense of what your legacy will be when someone lights a candle for you. What will they hold fast to in their hearts about you? How will you light the way for those who come after? And imagine in the chalice of your own being that you might light a candle within for that spark of commitment to live more deeply into that intention of what your legacy will be. Now another breath in. And out. And now we will join in singing our young people out, having had a time of centering, taking the light with them as they lead us into a bright future. Let us join in singing this little light of mine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Shine it out now, this little light of mine. hear our anthem since we already had our meditation and prayer. I appreciate you flowing with me.
our reading today um, contains some words of violence. It's not violent, but just to give you a little heads up. It's a reading, Dreams and Nightmares, by Lonnie Smith. I am both a man alive dying to live and a dying man living to die. This is the contrast of being sentenced to death by incarceration. Entering into prison is the very first time, for this very first time, on this conviction. I was full of remorse and needed to make some type of atonement to receive inner peace for the egregious act that brought me here. I wanted to change. This was a time when there was no incentive to change. I was given a de facto life sentence. The judge wanted me to die in prison, even when my attorney pleaded with him that I was capable of change and could be returned to useful citizenship, as our Constitution states is the reason for the Department of Correction. I knew I wasn't who they said I was. And long before Brian Stevenson coined the phrase, each of us is more than the worst thing we've ever done. I was poised to rehabilitate myself. I entered into rehabilitative programs and took college classes. While studying the Bible, and I didn't just focus on myself with my paralegal certificate, I drafted legal filings for illiterate people who were in custody and explained to them the court orders issued in their cases. When I wasn't helping it, illiterate guys understand the law, I was volunteering my time teaching them how to read. One of my proudest moments was the day I walked across the stage and received my master's degree from North Park University in restorative arts and ministry. And Reverend Allison was in attendance cheering me on. This was a day it didn't feel like I was in prison because Reverend Allison and two more of my lovely Unitarian Universalist guests of mine had a few hours of autonomy in the large theater building. But in the end, the only part of me that left the prison was my cap and gown. The scholar activist remained inside. One of my professors said I have shown exemplary rehabilitation, and yet I sit here decaying with so much potential to be a champion of change to my community that needs living testimonies to reach the youth. I may sound special or an exception to the rule, but I am not. There are guys here and women in Logan that are more gifted and talented than I. But our humanity is silenced by being hidden in these remote locations where there are limited opportunities to be heard. We need voices and advocates to move the needle of justice and mercy or we die in these living tombs. Empirical research has proven that judges cannot measure during the sentencing phase the capacity for people to change. There is a finality to the death penalty. There is a death date. You get a last meal, a chaplain to pray for your soul. The chemicals they use for lethal injection are supposed to spare pain. The whole process is supposed to create a sense of humanity within an inhuman practice. But suffering from an excessive punitive sentence is different. Death is stalking, praying, ready to pounce on you, and the system doesn't care how your life is extinguished. It can be violent. A slow death, a virus, malpractice, stabbing, beating, mental breakdown, torture. Suffering from death by incarceration is the same as enduring a botched execution. 
Let me show you a picture of me and Lonnie, the author of those powerful words. This is me and Lonnie at my visit, one of my visits this summer at Stateville Prison in Joliet. Thank you for showing that slide. I want to share with you some of my own experience. Lonnie and I first got together over our love for theology, for talking shop, basically. He was in seminary and I, as a Unitarian Universalist minister, couldn't get enough of connecting with him and geeking out about what we like to call bad theology, a punitive theology, one that is very much outside our Universalist teachings. And Lonnie and I bonded also over food that we wanted to eat. And when it began, it began with uh, Actually, one of our pen pals, Tracy, who's at the congregation in Hinsdale, had been sending me some of his writings, and I started sending her messages to send to him, and then eventually it became very clear that we needed, Lonnie and I needed to be pen pals. But before then, when I was in seminary, I took a class about ministering to survivors of human rights abuses, and I realized that that, and then I had no idea where it would lead me, would lead me to the place of being part of prison ministry and the Unitarian Universalist Prison Ministry of Illinois. I have a different feeling since I've taken classes like that where I've learned about the horrors that humans can inflict upon others, that especially around this time when I see depictions of violence and horror in the Halloween time, it has a different feeling for me. Because I hear a lot of hard and horrible stories about what people are going through in Illinois prisons and jails. And so as Lonnie so powerfully described Death is stalking you when you are there. And what a difficult and traumatic experience it must be just to live every single day in Illinois prisons, that it is a horror show that our tax dollars pay for. Let me show you a different picture of Lonnie, one that I love to show folks, which is, I call it Lonnie Sunshine because that is the smile and the spirit I know. And that smile and spirit is not because of prison and its rehabilitative ways. No, it is in spite of prison. And the next slide is from the event that he, he was describing in his reading about his graduation from North Park Seminary. Now, when I think of theater building, I think of an auditorium, I think of a beautiful space like this in this sanctuary or perhaps one when you would go see a show. But instead, let's think about an elementary school that's been abandoned, and so there's rust stains everywhere. And this was like the nice thing that we were supposed to be experiencing was, <laughs> so this is the auditorium area that you can see in the picture, and he, Lonnie is flanked by Unitarian Universalists who are there to cheer him on, including myself. And then in the next picture, I'll show you, this is all that we could take. His master's hood, the medallion, and the cap, and the gown. Death by incarceration is something that we at the UU Prison Ministry of Illinois want to be part of ending. Though the death penalty was abolished in the state of Illinois, as Lonnie describes and so many others describe, it is still happening. Death is happening in prison by people who are aging because of long-term sentences. In the spring of 2022, we conducted a prison condition survey for our inside members. So we have uh, nearly 100 members of people who are incarcerated in Illinois prisons, either through the Department of Corrections or federal prisons. And we heard back from them that their top concern was around the health care. 
And unfortunately, the healthcare is contracted out to a private company called Wexford. And it's very difficult to call them to account when even the Illinois Department of Corrections will not be called to account for its negligence. And so we realized that the best strategy we could come with was trying to get people out and to partner with organizations that are trying to do the same. And so the short-term goal that we've been taking on is working on and being a part of legislation that can end death by incarceration. So how many of you have ever seen like Law and Order? Yeah, like a cop show, a judge show, a court show, something like that. Okay, so usually, or have you ever like seen prison shows where people get to get reviewed? They get to be reviewed for parole? Well, there's no parole in Illinois. So there's something that came out called truth in sentencing in the 90s, these very harsh sentences, long-term sentences that also said there will be truth in this sentence, which means that when you get sentenced to this, this is what you will serve. Now the problem is with that, that that means that with no parole, there's no mechanism for someone to get release. Lonnie has been incarcerated, for instance, for 34 years. He is ready to give back to the community. He is ready to make up for the harm that he did when he was in his late teens, when his prefrontal cortex wasn't fully formed. And so what we are hoping to do is to begin to find ways to get people out through a process of review. The Prisoner Review Board right now doesn't ever have cases for parole. We want to create parole in Illinois. And one of the bills that's coming through is about elder parole. It's a very small way to start to try to create the parole process again in Illinois, whereby if a person has been incarcerated in Illinois prisons for 50, if they've been incarcerated for 25 years and they're over 55, that they would be eligible to be reviewed by the Prisoner Review Board of Illinois. It's a very small ask that would affect only 1,000 prisoners in Illinois. And yet it could make a huge difference in getting some of these people who have been incarcerated for so long potentially out. And all they're getting is just a review. They get to make a petition for a review if this law were to be put into effect. But part of why we as Unitarian Universalists and in our organization of the prison ministry care about ending death by incarceration is because we understand that we do have kinship with all people and that not any person is disposable. That no one is outside the circle of love and that all of us are always learning and growing and evolving and changing. And no one is outside of that experience. And so we are continuing to campaign to end death by incarceration. I'd like to share some words from one of our inside members who is incarcerated at Western Prison, which is a horrible place. Clifford Powers writes this about death by incarceration. The straightforward description of what death by incarceration is, is a circumstance where a person spends a significant length of time incarcerated so that they either die in custody or shortly after release. More complex and more accurate, I think, is the definition that takes into account all of the ways that the incarceration contributes to a person's death. This allows for varying lengths of time of a life to be considered, and it remains a fact that the longer the sentence, the more true it is. The phrase death by incarceration acknowledges the effective nature of being locked up. Is my sentence death by incarceration? Yes, my sentence requires me to spend 45 years in prison. That would have me released just over a month before I turn 64. While the life expectancy of the average person is about 10 years past this, it's not quite so for someone who grew up like I did, in poverty and with continuous drug and alcohol addiction from the ages of 11 to 19. Studies show that for someone who is sentenced at 25, the average life expectancy in prison is 64 years old. I have been incarcerated since I was 18, which would logically put my life expectancy at less than 64, which is when I'm slated to get out. Add to this the conditions that I've lived while in prison, my poor diet, stress, etc., and it's unlikely I will survive 
my sentence. It is possible, and I know, and know, of men who have lived more than 45 years in prison, but they are anomalies. Right now, one of the only ways that people can get out is by creating a petition, a huge packet called a clemency packet, by asking the governor of Illinois for executive clemency for their release. And so we also in our organization have been supporting those efforts. Here's one from last year, I'll show the next slide please, which is Unitarian Universalists who've been a part of the Free Bernina campaign. Bernina was sentenced very harshly. Those who are um, often identified as women are sentenced longer and more harshly than their male counterparts. And for Bernina's case also, Bernina identifies as LGBTQIA+, and so that made for an even harsher sentence. So the disparities in sentencing are quite real. And so there was a clemency hearing, and at the next image, you can see Unitarian Universalists joining up with others. We have some folks from our Bloomington Normal Unitarian Universalist congregation joining up with others in coalition to show support at Bernina's clemency hearing. So where we are and why we care is so important. So maybe you didn't come here to hear about prisons and, and parole, or maybe to hear from my friend Lonnie or Cliff, who's, whose voice I care about so deeply as one of our members. Maybe what you needed to hear today is that you are not disposable that you need not be remembered by your worst mistake. That each of us have opportunities to come again and again to the altar of life and keep trying to do better. This is what our beautiful and complicated faith can teach us. That we are all worthy of love. That we are all worthy of a second chance. Heck, maybe even just a first. And that as we come in this time, coming upon the all souls time, we are invited to think about the legacies that we are living into, not only in our own families or chosen families or our ancestors, if we know who our ancestors were, because not everybody does, but we're also invited to think about the legacy that we want to be living into and in creating for future generations. Do you have some worries about the future generations? About what it will be for them? I know I do. And just to acknowledge the pain and the suffering that is going on in this world, I have to take a breath and allow my heart to soften and break open to all the suffering that is around prayers for de-escalation in Gaza, prayers for those who have committed violence, even though, as one, one woman puts it who wrote a book, her name's Daniel Sarage, she says, no one enters violence for the first time by committing it. That there are these cycles of violence in this world, and yet we as Unitarian Universalists can commit to movements of anti-violence. And that's what we do here in the prison ministry work. It is honoring anti-violence work that has been going on for generations. Generations of people claiming, my body is worthy of not being harmed. And so we can claim that tradition for ourselves and light a way forward in whatever way our passion and our gifts may call us. And yes, it is heavy work, but my God, look at the light in front of us. Look at the beauty that it brings to acknowledge the pain can allow us to release it so that we can go forth and, hey, maybe even have some fun. Maybe bring some joy into each other's lives. Each of us carries heavy loads, each and every one of us. And yet we come together here in this space that we create, online, in person, to lighten that load for one another 
and to think of those who often have been pushed to the outside and invisibilized. We have lit candles for those who are not with us in body and in spirit, and we will take that light forward together, claiming the beauty and the richness that every human being deserves of a good life. And so I invite you in this time where the veil between the worlds of the living and dead might be imagined to be thinned, to commit yourself. Take a breath. Commit yourself to honor the dead and fight like hell for the living. It's in this way that we can bring paradise, reveal paradise as it is here, now, in this very moment. Live into this legacy of light and love so that those who go before us can look back and light candles for us in gratitude and in joy. May it be so. Blessed be. Amen. Good morning. I'm Lisa Gilley, and my pronouns are she, her. And um, about 2017, I went to a workshop with Joy wow. right here about the prison ministry. <clears throat> and then I went to an information session about uh, the pen pal program. And I admitted I went to learn about it. I didn't go because I wanted to be a pen pal. Uh, but at the end of the call, there was a spreadsheet shared on the screen and everybody else on the call signed up to be a pen pal and Joy signed up to be a pen pal and I thought if Joy does it and everybody else does it, I better do this. And so um, out of peer pressure and, and a little bit of shame for not being braver, I, I did uh, become a pen pal of uh, Columbus. And um, I picked him because of his name and because there is a, a column on the spreadsheet for religion and he was a Muslim and I thought, well, that's interesting. And um, so we began writing every single week for about two years. And um, somewhat to my, uh, I admit I was afraid, <laughs> to, he was being uh, brought back into the community about two years into our pen pal writing and so, in November of 2009, he was rejoining our community and we, Mike and I had lunch with him the following Friday at the Cheesecake Factory, because that's what he loves. And um, he and I have remained friends. We talk or text just about every month. He's my Facebook friend and um, he is the most disciplined person he has read way more than I have. He's had a very difficult life, a very difficult life. And he was in there since the age of about 21, and he's, uh, he was in there for 27 years. And um, I, I suppose you could say that, that I changed his life. I have uh, given him a little bit of money. I have loaned him quite a bit of money and he paid me back every single week, every single Friday, without an exception until the money was paid back. But I think he actually came with that discipline and um, I may have eased his return. Um, but I'll tell you what, he did change my life. And I learned uh, an awful lot about the things that Reverend Allison has shared with us today. I encourage you to think about this. There's a conversation after church that Al Reverend Allison will be leading. So um, I also encourage you to give to this cause, the UUPMI cause, and uh, you can impact people's lives and probably your own. Thank you.
And now please stand if you are willing or able, or sit with gusto if you cannot stand, <laughs> and sing with me uh, number 127, Can I See Another's Woe? words of benediction, I wanted to share a quote from Akil, one of our former Inside members who's now been released, who is connected with one of your members, Vince Unger. And he became an imam. I know, like, right? He's out. Yay. Akil became an imam when he was locked up, and he says this, the Holy Quran says, verily, oppression is worse than slaughter. The real death by incarceration is not the pine box, but the suppression of all that it means to be human. <laughs> These closing words are by Le Leah Derlin Jones. For those who came before us, we offer gratitude and thanks. May their memories be a blessing. May we feel surrounded by their love. As we go forth from this time and place, let us be inspired by their courage, their wisdom, and their dreams. Let us honor them by doing the work of living boldly, loving mightily, and creating heaven on earth. Oh, <laughs> amen. <laughs> amen and blessed be. <laughs> Peace.